Well, good morning, team. Chemistry Coach coming at you again. Still looking at all these different properties and how electron configurations and electron shielding affect them. Are there trends on the periodic table, right? So we've looked at you know, atomic size. We've looked at ionization energy, electron affinity, whole bunch of good stuff, magnetic properties. Let's do a little jaunt back into the past. Unfortunately, it may not be a trip that you uh, care to remember, the redox trip, <laughs> right? I find a lot of college students really dislike redox reactions. You know, the transfer of an electron. That's all redox is. Reducing agent gives an electron to the oxidizing agent. It's that simple, right? So we're going to look at the two factors of that. Reducing strength, we're going to look at the reducing agent, the reducer, which is the species that donates the electron, right? The electron source in a redox reaction. And then the oxidizing agent is what receives the electron or takes the reaction. So let's look at no particular order. Let's like look at reducing strength first and then oxidizing strength and see if, you know, some of the parameters we've been talking about, some of these atomic properties, is that what reducing and oxidizing strength really comes from, right? Is it what, what properties would it be based on if we needed to characterize it or even uh, calculate it? You know, if we wanted to do that and rank reducing strengths. And is there a, a distinct trend on the periodic table? If we grab a periodic table, right, and go down or across, is there a distinct trend? Are, do they become stronger reducers, weaker reducers, stronger or weaker? Is there a trend and can we predict that? But we need the definition first, right? So a reducer or reducing agent is the electron donor in a redox reaction, right? If, because if I give you an electron, here's an electron, have it, that's yours, boop, right there. You just picked up a negative particle. I gave you a negative particle. You got reduced. I'm the reducer. So what determines how readily I give you that electron? So think about the properties we've talked about. I need to lose an electron and to give it to you. Would it make sense that the easier it is for me to lose that electron, the more likely I'm going to reduce you? You think about, while I pause this and write the answer up on the next board, which atomic property we've been talking about determines the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron. Hopefully this makes gut level sense to you, right? So that it, that since a reducer, if I'm a reducer and I have to lose an electron and give it to you, the easier it is for me to lose my electron, the more reactive I am or the stronger I am as a reducer or a reducing agent, right? So what, what atomic property determines the strength that an electron is held? The ionization energy, pretty much metals, right? So hopefully you can see why metals tend to be good reducers and non-metals don't because we know metals love to get rid of electrons to become isoelectronic with the prior noble gas, right? Thus becoming a, you know, a cation themselves. But there's other types of, you know, it doesn't have to be a metal. Anything that gives an electron can be a reducer. But it's based on its ionization energy, the energy it takes to remove an electron. Would it make sense that the, the lower the ionization energy, the easier it is to have an electron removed and donated to something else to cause reduction, the stronger the reducer is. <gasps> Does that make sense? So as I, these are opposites. As ionization energy decreases, reducing strength increases. Ionization goes down, it's easier to lose the, the electron, the stronger it is. So we need to look at the trends of ionization energy, which are opposite atomic size, by the way, on the periodic table, and we should be able to track the reducing strength of species on the periodic table based on its opposite trend of ionization energy. So grab your ionization energy chart. If you have this from my website, great, All right? This is in no way complete, but we're gonna focus on the metals here, All right? Focus on the metals. So we're gonna look and see how, do the, how does reducing strength change as we go down or across based on ionization energy values. Let's go ahead and so I'll draw part of that table up real quick. Let's have a look-see here. So I just put a couple of trends on the board here. I just took uh, sodium to rubidium. So we're taking sodium, potassium, rubidium, magnesium, calcium, strontium. So just this block right here. So we're zooming in on the periodic table here, but we should see this trend pretty, pretty complete across the table here. And again, we're going to focus on metals only because they obviously they have a tendency of giving electrons away. So if we look at just size, look at the size. Obviously, it gets bigger going down and smaller going across, right? Bigger ends going down, Z affected increases going this way. 
Ionization energy value is 495.8 kilojoules per mole for sodium. Drops to 418.7 kilojoules per mole for potassium because it's getting bigger. It gets easier to remove the electron, right? And then 403.2 kilojoules per mole for rubidium. So as they get bigger, ionization energy gets smaller, right? We learned that before. They're opposites of each other. Because the bigger it is, the further that outer electron away is. Same thing with magnesium, 737.1 kilojoules per mole. Decreases to 589.4 kilojoules per mole for calcium to 549.9. So you see that trend, both the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals. But let's look left to right. Obviously, it's getting smaller, so ionization energy should get larger. So it jumps from 495.8 to 737.1 kilojoules per mole. It increases from potassium to calcium and rubidium to strontium. So ionization energy values increase going across and decrease going down. So we should be able to look at reducing strength from this. It gets easier to remove an electron going down. Do you see that? So as we're heading down the period, down a column, right? If we're heading down a column, let's see if we can figure out what's happening here. Going down a column, size is increasing. Agree? All right. So going down a column, size increases. What do we know about ionization energy? You don't even need the numbers. You could figure this out. If the size is increasing, ionization energy is decreasing going down a column. Let's write this here. So going down a column, size gets bigger. Ionization energy goes down. If it's easier to remove an electron, stronger reducing strength, right? We'll do that in blue. Increased reducing strength. That's what we're after right there. So as you move down the periodic table, if you want to write that out as a separate sentence, reducing strength increase. Now, of course, you can memorize that and just say, well, as you go down the periodic table, right? actually becomes more, you, another way you can think that it becomes more metallic, more likely to lose an electron, so it's more metallic in character in the lower left. So these babies down here, whoop, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. So as you move down, it's easier to remove an electron because the lower ionization energy because it's bigger. These are stronger reducing agents and more metallic. So more metallic going this way, less metallic, which makes sense because you're going from metals to non-metals, less metallic going that way across, more metallic coming down. So reducing strength increases. Now, if we're going across, right, so if we go across a row, what's happening there? Well, obviously it's getting smaller, right? You should be able to predict that from the uh, increasing Z effective. So size, is decreasing, right? And you can look, now you don't need the values because the size is getting smaller, because of increased Z effective, it holds the electrons in tighter. So ionization energy is increasing. Right? You don't need numbers to see it, but it increases quite dramatically, which means it's holding onto that electron harder. It's harder to remove the electron going left to right, which means it's a weaker reducer. It doesn't react as intently, right? So in this case, reducing strength decreases. That's what we're after. So reducing strength decreases going this way and increases going that way. So what would we expect if we did a lab? Well, let's say we tried to react, you know, sodium versus rubidium. Rubidium would react more violently would be my guess. And we're actually going to do some reactions if we pop them. Have you ever done that where you pop these in water? Produces hydrogen gas. You get the poof. They're really fun reactions. I uh, melted down the ceiling once, but don't tell anybody. Too big of a chunk of sodium. Oh, it exploded a bigger ones too. Dangerous. And I would expect since it gets a weaker reducing agent this way, I would expect calcium to be less reactive than potassium. I would expect aluminum to be less reactive than magnesium, which is less reactive than sodium. You see that? So you might expect sodium to react with water explosively, but magnesium to not, right? Um, 
And you can actually see these reactions. If you drop potassium in water, you get this beautiful purple flame and explodes really nicely. Calcium, you've probably all done that one. It's a great way to generate hydrogen gas and collect it by inverting. I did a video where you invert the uh, test tube full of water and you collect the gas and see if it's flammable. So I would expect calcium to be let, you know, forms bubbles in the water of hydrogen, but potassium is way more reactive. But I would expect the reactivity to decrease. decrease. These probably don't even react with water. You know what I'm saying? So let's look at some of those reactions real quick, just as a reminder, and we'll be done with reducers. All right, here's some reactions you probably did in introductory chemistry lab would be, I would expect, right? So I know we have a lab where we put, you know, sodium, potassium, calcium, and look at the, the different intensity of the reactions and kind of rank the trends of reaction strength. Well, you look at why here, it's all based on reducing strength, which is based on ionization energy, effectively, right? So if we look at alkali metals, which have lower ionization energies, than the corresponding alkaline earth metals next to them, right? But remember, right? Lower ionization energies here, higher ionization energies here. So if you're going across, it gets less reactive, down more reactive. So I did cesium and barium. So if we take a look at cesium here, way down here, that's an alkali metal and barium's an alkaline earth metal. So we'd expect the cesium to be very reactive, probably explosive in water, just like rubidium and potassium, and probably more reactive than these babies. So I've done sodium and melted the ceiling down once. Potassium, a little more dangerous, looks more cool because of the lavenderish flame. I've never, I'm kind of kooky, I've never even done these two. I wouldn't. You can probably go Google that from, you know, some crazy people who wanted to do that on their own, you know, blow a bathtub or something. It was a Mythbusters, I think Mythbusters did that. If you check out Mythbusters, they did all the different alkali metals. And I think they actually like destroyed a bathtub and part of a concrete wall or something. It's awesome, right? So we expect those to be more reactive. But just comparing these two, I would expect barium to be less reactive than Syrian. And we're going to look at how they are reducing agents in water. We'll see uh, in the next video on the acid basic strength. They form bases in water. They're, they're reactive enough to react with water uh, and form bases. So they're called basic, you know, um, the metals form bases. So if we take cesium, and I've already reduced, remember redox reactions, got to make sure the charge, so the charge on this side's neutral, charge on this side's neutral, so it has to be balanced so you have electrical neutrality on both sides. But the cesium starts as a zero. The hydrogen starts as a plus one for its oxidation number. The cesium donates electrons, right, over to the hydrogen atoms in the water. So the water drops from a plus one, not the water, but the hydrogens in the water drop from a plus one to a zero and end up becoming uh, the element hydrogen. And that's a gas, so you see the bubbles coming out. And then the cesium loses an electron and gets oxidized up to cesium plus one. And if you did the molecular equation, you just write two cesium hydroxides. But since that's a soluble, it would separate out. So this is the, uh, the, the net ionic equation there. Right? Very, very dramatic. Enough so it's exothermic enough where it can ignite that hydrogen. And boom! <laughs> it's really cool. Alkaline earth metals, less reactive. Same type of reaction, but you don't get the boom. You still get the hydrogen gas, but it's not exothermic enough to really create an explosion. Still cool, though. Good way to collect hydrogen. Um, so here, the barium's going from a zero, losing two electrons, going to a plus two. Again, the hydrogen's reduced. That's why the metal is the reducing agent, because it's donating the electron, causing the hydrogen to be reduced. So just an example of the type of reactions you'll see. Um, but you would actually see these trends in the laboratory. And you could predict it based on ionization energies. But hey, there you go. Let's look at oxidizing strength, which would be, obviously, if metals tend to be reducers, you would think nonmetals would tend to be the opposite, or oxidizers. They like to give electrons. They like to take electrons. Let's do oxidizing strength. When we are looking at oxidizing strength, the opposite of reducing strength, and if reducing strength applied to metals, this probably applies to nonmetals. You could apply it to anything, but it's really mostly for nonmetal. Now remember, an oxidizing agent, or slang oxidizer, is something that takes an electron from the, re remember, redox is the electron goes from the reducing agent to the oxidizing agent. So the reducing agent is the electron donor. The oxidizing agent is the electron acceptor or taker, depending on the stronger it is, the more likely it's taking electrons, right? And when you take an electron away, if I take a negatively charged electron from you, 
I just increased your oxidation number because you lost a negative particle. So if you were at a plus one, you just, you're now a plus two. If you're at a zero, you're now at a plus one. If you're at a negative three, you're now a negative two. If I take one or more electrons, which means you got oxidized. So I am the oxidizing agent because I took your electron. So the atomic property that really determines oxidizing strength is how readily I accept or take electrons, right? So what's the energy change involved when I accept an electron? Well, that's electron affinity, right? The opposite of ionization energy. So oxidizing strength is based on electron affinity trends. Well, let's look at that. So if you have that from my website, that table of, it's not a complete table, but you know, different electron affinities and kilojoules per mole, nowhere complete, but it just gives you a rough idea. Not the not as trendy as atomic size and ionization energy, but still, and remember, electron affinity could be a positive or negative. So if it's positive, it's not favorable. It's if it's negative, it's more favorable. So the more negative the, the electron affinity, the more readily it will accept electrons and the stronger the oxidizing agent. Let's write that down in a sentence on the next board. All right, I took another block of the periodic table here. So I took sulfur, selenium, and tellurium for the chalcogens, right? So sulfur, selenium, tellurium, chlorine, bromine, iodine. I took this six element block right there just to give you a, a zoomed in glance of what these trends kind of look like. So we can see, you know, does oxidizing strength increase going across a, a, a row or, or does it increase or decrease going down a column? Let's take a look at the numbers. Now remember, size gets smaller going across and larger going down, right? We relate that to ionization energy, not to electron affinity, though. So let's take a look at its ability to add electrons or gain electrons. Let's look at the energy change. So the electron, if the, and I only did the first electron affinity. For sulfur, it's negative 200.4. These are all kilojoules per mole. If you go over to chlorine, it goes dramatically up to negative 349.0. So way more happy to get electrons, way more uh, uh, um, uh, reactive, you could say. So I would say from this that chlorine is much stronger as an oxidizing agent. It's more likely to take an electron for something. It's a much more favorable energetically than sulfur. It'd be a much more violent reaction. Same thing, selenium to bromine, you're going from negative 195.0 way up to negative 324.6. So bromine's way more reactive and selenium as far as taking electrons and causing oxidation. And tellurium to iodine, negative 190.2 to negative 295.2. So can we make the logical conclusion from this that moving left to right across a row, as we're going across the periodic table, oxidizing strength increases. There's some exceptions, of course, because it's not quite as trendy. But I would say across a row, oxidizing strength increases. Everybody okay with that conclusion? You can see it gets way more exothermic, way more favorable to accept electrons. So they're more likely to take electrons. More fun reactions in lab two. Now let's look at going down a column, right? So what happens when we go down a column? Let's take a look at the values. So sulfur in the chalk engines, we're going negative 200.4 to negative 195.0 to negative 190.2. So it's more exothermic and more favorable higher up. Let's look at in the halogens. Negative 349.0 for chlorine, negative 324.6 for bromine, and negative 295.2 kilojoules per mole for iodine. So again, more exothermic, more favorable on the top. So it looks like as you go down, the pattern in general looks like it gets less reactive. Do you see that? Because the electron affinity gets less favorable. So I would say going down a column, oxidizing strength, decreases. We can make those assumptions from the electron affinity values. So we can say from the periodic table, especially for nonmetals over here, reactivity decreases going down. So I'd accept bromine's more reactive than iodine, chlorine's more reactive than that, fluorine's more reactive than that. And then going across, right, it becomes more reactive, right? So 
I would say chlorine's more reactive than sulfur, more reactive than phosphorus. So these are mo these are the most reactive, not including noble gases. These are the most reactive nonmetals, right? Because they have the most exothermic, most favorable electron affinities, and these are the most reactive metals because they have the lowest ionization energies. So more metallic here more non-metallic here. Does it make sense? These love to react with these. These love to take electrons. These love to give electrons. It's a perfect marriage. I want to get rid of my electron. You want to take one. So the, the most energetic reactions would be the most metallic metals down here with the lowest ionization energies, easiest to take electrons from, with the most reactive non-metals with the most exothermic electron affinity. They love to take electrons. So reacting fluorine with cesium or francium, Woo, Debbie, don't try that one at home, gang. Right? Pretty easy to see the trends. Let's look at some uh, simple reactions with this, you know, pitting up a halogen versus another halogen. You know, if one has the electron, can the other one take the electron from it or not? Something you might have done in introductory labs. All right, we're going to do a halogen death match 2000, right? Put them, in, put them in the octagon, see what happens. So remember, we're, we're saying who, we're fighting over the electron. Who gets the electron? Oh, no, get it, get it, get it. <laughs> Don't step on my laptop. Woo, we just saved this video. <laughs> Sorry, beach. So we're pitting these two against each other, and it's kind of like a football when we When I was a kid, we used to play a game, you know, whoever had the football, everybody else tried to take the football from them. And if you were stronger, you could take the football away. Imagine the football's the electron, right? So if I've got the football, if you're stronger than me, boom, 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 you rip it out of my hands. Hey, so who's got the more favorable electron affinity? That's your football taking strength, right? Huh? So let's put up iodine versus chlorine, right? Say we can get them in a, you know, so we don't kill ourselves in lab. We're not going to use the pure forms with the toxic gases. Just make little dilute solutions of them. Not super soluble, but we can get a little bit in there. So let's take, you know, something like sodium chloride, where we have the chlorine in the anion form, and then the diatomic elemental iodine. Notice the chlorine has the electron because it's the chloride to start with in this reaction. So the question is, can the iodine, is it strong enough to take the electron away from the chlorine? Is it strong enough? Well, let's look at the electron affinity value. Iodine's a negative 295.2 kilojoules per mole. Chloride, chlorine in this case, negative 349.0. So chloride is, has the more favorable electron affinity. So that's the strongest person in the game. Between, and there's only two people, so you're like fighting with your best friend or something. And they happen to be stronger than you. They're more likely. So which means the iodine's too weak to take the electron away. So I would get rid of this and say no reaction. Right? Because the iodine is too weak of an oxidizing agent to take the electron away from the chlorine. Or the chloride in this case. Well, it's okay, so they're victorious. All right, now they get to take on the next newcomer, right? It's like playing ping pong or something. All right, I beat you. Who's next? Who's next? So now we've got, let's do it this way. We've got chlorine as the diatomic, right, uh, element, and bromine as the bromide. It has the electron. So the question is, is the chlorine strong enough to take the electron away from the bromine? Let's look at the electron affinities. Negative 349.0 kilojoules per mole for chlorine. Negative 324.6 kilojoules per mole for bromine. It's more of an even match than the iodine and the chlorine, but still chlorine is stronger, more favorable, more reactive than bromine. So the question is, can the chlorines take the electron away from the bromide? Heck yeah, they can rip the football away. So yes, you're gonna see a reaction here. And what happens is the chlorine diatomic molecule splits in half. You give us two chlorides. Well, it can only take one electron, which means we need two bromides, which lose the electrons and become neutral bromine atoms, which combine to give us neutral diatomic bromine. So chlorine is going from zero to minus one. It's being reduced. Bromine is going from negative one to zero. It's being oxidized, so the chlorine is oxidizing the bromine. Now, if we put fluorine in here, it would kick everybody's butt. It's more involved. You'll see the electron affinities. The trend isn't quite right for fluorine. There's other factors involved, which is on a need-to-know basis next semester. 
there you go. Let's look at the last part of this particular section. Uh, in topic, let's look at acid-base behavior, which I briefly mentioned.